Hey guys, Dr. Jason Saunders here, uh, keeping the conversation going around oxygen and oxygen absorption into our tissues, into our cells. We're getting a ton of questions here in regards to a few things. One, what's the difference? I'm talking about pressure in the environment or hyperbaric pressure. Um, what's the difference between that type of pressure and being on a ventilator? Because both are creating pressure. So exactly what is the difference? And there's an enormous difference. So I want to cover that today. And then there have been multiple questions and comments in our videos, as well as, you know, a variety of articles being put out there about turning airplanes into uh, hyperbaric chambers. So I want to cover the parts of those questions that I can answer. And then I'm hoping to leave that discussion open to people who could actually fill in the blanks on some of the other areas. In other words, I understand pressure, air pressure, and how our body responds to that, but I'm not necessarily uh, a, a plain engineer. Uh, I don't know the materials that are being used. Um, I'm not sure the safety in regards to pressurizing a chamber for medical use. So uh, I'll discuss some of those concepts as well but I'm hoping to open a dialogue around, uh, is this even a viable option? And if it is, uh, how might we be able to start to implement that? So let me get you on a screen share. So I just wanna show you here, this is basically uh, you know, just showing uh, different elevations above sea level and below sea level. Uh, and I'm hoping to help use this illustration to show you the differences between uh, how oxygen works inside of our body. So uh, over here, you see that we're talking about, uh, we're at sea level, and then we're just basically slowly climbing up to 30,000 feet. And we'll talk about what that looks like in terms of the pressure of oxygen, as well as uh, the percentages of oxygen that are available. And then again, here's at sea level, as we descend below sea level, uh, what are the effects of oxygen uh, pressure there? And of course, oxygen absorption there as well. Notice that, you know, as we go up, we're talking thousands and thousands of feet. And as we go down, we're not, right? Nine feet, 15, 27, 33. So the amount of descent we need to change the pressure of oxygen uh, percentage-wise is much lower uh, than the amount of elevation that is required before we start to see uh, significant changes in the oxygenation of our body. So there are a lot of different units that people use, atmospheres, atmospheres absolute, um, Pascal's, uh, uh, PSI, millimeters of mercury. So depending on whether you're in the medicine field and you tend to look at things as millimeters of mercury, uh, or you're in the diving field and you tend to look at things at feet underwater or um, uh, or atmosphere is absolute, you know, these, these conversations can get pretty confusing. And so what I'm hoping to do here is I'm hoping to uh, sh just basically use the same units of measurement for the purposes of this video to try to keep things a little bit more simple. So we're going to be talking about elevation in terms of feet and descent in terms of feet. We're going to be talking about pressure both in PSI and in millimeters of mercury. And we're going to be talking about percentages of oxygen. Now, here's the thing. So at sea level, we have 14.7 PSI, which leads to 159 millimeters of mercury of O2 and 21% oxygen. Now, the 14.7 is, is sea level, and uh, that's the amount of pressure that our atmosphere puts on the air at sea level, which creates a pressure of oxygen of 159 millimeters of mercury. And no matter where we go, whether we're going up or whether we're going down, so as we ascend up or as we descend down, uh, the the, the actual percentage of oxygen in the air is always 21%, basically, okay? Again, by the way, just for simplicity, I'm gonna be using round numbers for the most part. Uh, they, they may not be exact, but it's just for the purposes of just understanding this material a little bit better, okay? So let's just say that in the air that we all breathe, it's roughly 21% oxygen 
and roughly 79% nitrogen, okay? It's not, it's definitely more complicated than that. But just again, for the video's sake, let's just say that it is. So, so at, um, at sea level, we're looking at 14.7 PSI of pressure from the atmosphere, 159 millimeters of mercury of oxygen, which leads to an effective 21% um, of oxygen that we could breathe. As we go up, we're gonna be talking about a decrease in percentage of oxygen. That's not really a decrease in the percentage, like I'm saying, air, no matter where we are, is still 21%. But the difference between uh, going up in elevation or descending down below sea level is the, um, how close together the air molecules are. So as we ascend up, air molecules start to separate. And so even though it's 21% oxygen, there's, uh, there's so much more distance between the molecules that the, because of less pressure, that the effective dosage of oxygen becomes less. And that's the numbers that we're gonna be using. So as you see the oxygen in, uh, decreasing as we go up in elevation, or you see the percentages of oxygen going up as we descend below, it's still not changing the actual percentage, it's just changing the effective dosage of oxygen, okay? So I hope that that's pretty clear. So. Let's talk about as we ascend up. So here's we're at 5,000 feet. So at 5,000 feet, we're looking at, instead of 14.7, we're looking at 12 PSI. We're looking at about um, 130, instead of 159 millimeters of mercury. And we're looking at about 17.3%. Okay, so as we ascend, we lose a little bit of pressure of the atmosphere, we lose a little bit of pressure of the actual oxygen, and as a result, we're at a decrease uh, percentage of effective oxygen absorption, okay? As we continue to ascend, we're at 8,000 feet, now we're looking at 11 PSI. Again, these are, these are average uh, estimate numbers, they're not exact. Um, So as we get to 8,000 feet, we're looking at 11 PSI, 119 millimeters of mercury, and about 15% effective uh, dosage of oxygen. As we continue to go up at 15,000 feet, which is really a, a, a point where we can't, so we could live at 5,000 feet and we could adapt to that via increased red blood cells. You could live at 8,000 feet. It's getting very challenging at that point, but again, our body can adapt and improve the red blood cell counts, which will allow us to carry oxygen more effectively under normal circumstances. Um, once we're getting beyond that, it's really not suitable for, for spending really long periods of time. 15,000 feet for sure is not a place that we can uh, stay very long and still get enough oxygen. Here we're looking at about 8.3 PSI. We're looking at about 90 from a uh, pressure of oxygen and we're looking at effective about 11.8% um, dosage of oxygen. And then at 30,000 feet, you know, we often fly even higher than that, but at 30,000 feet, you're looking at 4.36 PSI. You're looking at only 47 millimeters of mercury, and you're looking at an effective 6% of oxygen. And so a couple things, this brings up, um, with an airplane, you know, can an airplane be a hyperbaric chamber? So uh, the thing here is that I did not go to art school, by the way, so forgive me. <laughs> uh, that's an airplane. So um, in an airplane flying at 30,000 feet or, or higher, you need to pressurize the cabin, you know, add air pressure to the cabin so that you could mimic lower types of uh, atmospheric pressure. So what they're gonna do is that cabin is pressurized as a result of the pressurized cabin at 30,000 feet. You know, now depending on the airplane that you're in and depending on the, uh, the altitude that you're flying, there's gonna be a different range of, of PSI. But basically where I was saying at 30,000 feet, you're at like four PSI. Well, if you added 10 PSI to that number, in other words, pressurize the cabin to 10 PSI greater, you would be at 14 PSI, back to basically, back to sea level. 
So depending on the airplane and the height that you're, or the altitude that you're flying, the cabin is pressurized, adding PSI of air so that you can get, typically it's somewhere between five and 8,000 um, equivalent uh, of air pressure, getting you somewhere around 15 to 17% um, oxygen. And so that is creating a change in atmospheric pressure with inside the cabin to allow for your experience to be that you can be on that airplane and effectively breathe without having any uh, signs of hypoxia. Now, that being said, we all do have some signs, right? A lot of us don't travel very well or don't feel as well when we travel. And some of that does have to do with the fact that if you're not used to being at five or 8,000 feet and you spent six hours at that altitude, you're not really getting you know, full sea level oxygenation. So there are some symptoms associated with that, but we can stay like that for many, many hours, um, survive and certainly be okay to recover you know, within a day or so after that. So that's basically the mechanics of how a lot of this stuff works. But I wanna bring up here the difference between, let's say being on a vent and being in an airplane. So in a ventilator, picture a balloon and imagine the balloon is your lung. So on a ventilator, you're literally blowing up the lungs the way you would, blow up a balloon. And so that pressure is direct pressure through your airway into your lungs to help you mechanically breathe. Because for whatever reason, let's say in, in this scenario, you know, if you have ARDS or some type of pneumonia, you're literally unable to mechanically properly get full breaths. And so being on a ventilator could be life or death in some of those scenarios, because now the machine is helping expand and contract your lungs to allow for a more normal and full breath. Now contrast that to being on an airplane. You, the airplane is pressurized. So the air on the plane is pressurized, but you don't feel that in your lungs. You may feel that in your ears. And so we need to yawn or chew gum or blow our ears out so that we can equalize with the pressure, but we don't feel that as a direct pressure on our lungs because every time you breathe, you're equalizing the air. So as, you're, as you're, the airplane is going up and you take breaths in and out, although the altitude is changing and the pressure is changing, because you're breathing, every breath you take helps your lung, uh, your lung and chest cavity equalize with the pressure. It's just like scuba diving. You can't just hold your breath and go down or go up. We know that there's issues with chest expansion and lung, and lung expansion or collapsing, depending on those pressure changes, the same would be true in the airplane. And so as long as we're breathing, we don't feel that direct pressure on our lungs. However, that pressure has an enormous impact on our oxygenation level, our ability to bring oxygen into our body and into our cells. If we didn't pressurize that cabin, by the time we hit 10,000 feet, everybody would be feeling it. 15,000 feet, we wouldn't be able to stay there beyond forget 30,000 or 35,000 feet where a lot of, you know, airlines go. So, you know, that's the most uh, simple explanation of how being in a pressurized vessel, an airplane, actually allows for the normalization of oxygenation of our tissues at elevations that shouldn't allow that to occur. So now let's use that same example and start going below sea level. Okay, so at sea level, uh, again, 14.7 PSI, 159 milli millimeters of mercury, and about 21% oxygen. So if we went nine feet below, we would be adding about 4.2 PSI to the 14.7. So you have to add those two together. Uh, the effective uh, oxygen pressure at that would be 205 millimeters of mercury, which would get us to about 29% oxygen instead of 21. Okay. Again, we're talking just air right now. We're not talking about using a hyperbaric oxygen, hundred percent system. We're talking about all we're doing right now is we're pressurizing the air. So simply by pressurizing the air, an extra four and change PSI, we're going to increase the pressure of oxygen and we're going to increase the effective dose of percentage of oxygen that's, that's um, absorbable to us. As we keep going down, uh, if we went to 15 feet, it would be a positive 7.5 PSI, again, adding to that 14.7. We would be uh, basically around 241 millimeters of mercury, which is gonna end up being about 52% uh, more oxygen available. At 27 feet below, 
we're looking at 12 PSI additional, which is about 290 millimeters of mercury. And it's about, what does that end up being? Um, 80, I think about 82 to 83% oxygen. And then if we go to 33 feet, so 33 feet, the reason I use that number is that's literally a full atmosphere. So that's going to double 33 feet underwater is literally going to be a doubling of all of these numbers. Okay. And so you're looking at an additional 14.7 uh, PSI. The oxygen pressure is, uh, sorry about that. The oxygen pressure there is 319 instead of 159 and it's a 100% increase in oxygen or it's basically doubling the uh, the effective oxygen available at those pressures. Now, again, these are not enormous pressures. You're looking at somewhere between uh, four and 14 PSI and you can massively change the effective uh, percentage of oxygen available just within that range. And most airplanes have the capacity to pressurize between eight and 12 PSI inside their cabin. And so if they're pressurizing between eight and 12 PSI, we could easily come up with, you know, ranges of oxygen. Again, that's without even using the oxygen system. Now, these are things that, again, I can answer certain questions around this and not others. So um, every seat in an airplane has uh, an oxygen system, right? So we know that if altitude drops significantly, or we lose cabin pressure, you know, we might have oxygen masks falling from the ceiling. We put those oxygen masks on. Now, there's not a ton of oxygen on those airplanes. It's really just meant for, you know, if we needed to do a quick descent to get back to, you know, some eight, 5,000, 8,000 feet, so where we can breathe, there's enough oxygen to take that uh, descent down so that we can be breathing while the airplane gets back to an altitude where we wouldn't need oxygen. Now, it is plumbed for oxygen. So if the airplane was on the ground and we changed the oxygen system to allow for a great deal more oxygen uh, available, could we flow enough oxygen at enough pressure for a long enough period of time and preferably not through those masks, maybe through a hood system or something else where we can deliver a rate of oxygen that even exceeds uh, what's typically on an airplane. I don't know the answers to questions like that, okay? But what I do know is that I know that an airplane is definitely capable of pressurizing, you know, somewhere between eight and 12 PSI. And I know that if we can pressurize somewhere between eight and 12 PSI, we could massively increase the percentages of oxygen. Now, again, these are numbers used. Those are simply numbers of air. Air is only 21% oxygen. If we were actually at 100% oxygen with those same pressures, we have a whole different story. This is the, instead of 205 at nine feet, we would be at like 977, which is, you know, almost, um, it's like six X times that pressure. If we were at 15 feet or seven and a half PSI, we would be around 1150 uh, millimeters of mercury, which would be about, you know, seven times. Uh, at 27 feet or, or 12 PSI extra, um, that number is 1380. Uh, so that's about eight times more oxygen. And at 33 feet, you're at uh, 1520. It's basically 10 times. So we can get huge increases just using air, right? But if we actually were in a 100% oxygen environment or breathing, let's say we had a hood or a really good mask and we were breathing 100% oxygen at those pressures, we would be uh, literally six times, seven times, eight times, 10 times more oxygen absorption. And then because of pressure, and we, we covered this in early videos, so I'm not going to go through it again, pressure allows us to dissolve oxygen into the plasma of our blood. It allows us to bypass the red blood cell carrying capacity, which allows us to deliver an enormous amount of oxygen independent from uh, the typical hemoglobin red blood cell carrying capacity. And so using a system like this, is it possible? Based on the numbers, it's absolutely possible. Based on the mechanics of the airplane, the plumbing of the oxygen system, those are the things I don't know about. So again, I'm just opening this conversation up. I'm trying to give some numbers to it so people understand how it all works. 
And I'm hoping that it, it opens a, a dialogue for people who actually might know some of the more, some of the other answers to the questions that, that I don't know. So anyway, thanks again for your attention and um, thanks for listening.